Welcome to this webisode of Roche's Virtual International Experience Exchange for patient organizations. With IEPO 2020 having gone fully virtual, we have turned the content of what would have been discussed in Berlin this year into exciting virtual formats. Webisodes like this one have replaced the six original learning labs. They feature members of the IEPO community and are available for viewing or download on iepo.com. And they contain discussion questions and links to related resources such as posters submitted by patient organizations from around the world. Now this webisode will explore the topic of responsible health data sharing and I'm happy to welcome Nicola Bedlington and Alistair Kent who will be discussing how to build trust and confidence in health data. So let me start with a few words about our two speakers and you can find the full bios on iepo.com. Nicola Bedlington is a special advisor to the European Patients Forum where she served as a Secretary General and Executive Director from 2006 until last year. She is also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Health and Healthcare. And Alistair Kent was the Executive Director of Genetic Alliance UK for almost 25 years. And that's a UK alliance of over 200 patient support groups for patients and families with rare and genetic disorders. He continues to work on the needs and expectations of patients and families affected by these diseases. There is an increasing drive to improve the collection, sharing and use of patients' data for better and more sustainable personalized healthcare and research. However, patients also want a person-centered system where technology and data bring added value. And we also want to play a role in the development of technologies and data governance the implementation, evaluation, policy, and data research. So Nicola and Alistair will be discussing these issues with a focus on fostering trust, confidence, and the responsible use of data, including some best practice examples of how this can be achieved. And both Nicola and Alistair are also members of the EAPO Patient Advisory Council. So Nicola, what is the value of health data for patients? The value of health data for patients is really multifaceted. When it comes to health systems, it means advancing on integrated care, looking at measurement to actually lead to better health outcomes, effectiveness, efficiency, reduction of waste. When it comes to innovation, it means supplementing clinical trial research with real world data, real world evidence, really advancing and accelerating innovation, not just in relation to therapeutics, but also the whole range of medical technology. It also means actually improving the quality of the relationship between patients and their healthcare professionals and shared decision making based on data, based on facts, so enhancing participation and very much linked to that patient empowerment, patients collecting and using their own data to enhance self-management and quality of life. And all of that, of course, requires a certain level of health data literacy and confidence and trust. Yes, I think it's um, important to recognise the, the role that data plays. I mean, without if you if you have no data then you're in the dark but data collected interpreted uh, enables everything else to happen because with data you can generate information information then leads to to, to knowledge uh, about the condition about uh, its its implications with knowledge you can uh, plan actions you can decide what is the most appropriate intervention to make uh, either as a patient or a carer uh, uh, for yourself, it can influence the course of uh, course of your management of your condition, and for your your medical advisors, for your doctors, it helps them to determine what the most appropriate intervention might be for you in your situation, such that you can maximise the health gain that you can experience, and of course, it it leads to the opportunities for further research and greater insights, which will improve the situation for for others down the line. So how comfortable are patients in general about sharing health data and specifically, what has been the effect of the recent global health crisis, COVID-19? I think that patients with chronic conditions have a, a slightly different perspective 
than the general public with regard to data sharing. And this comes from living with a very serious condition, understanding the benefits of health research and wanting to contribute to that, to be able to help support their peers, future generations and wider society. Um, I think very often patients are, are ambassadors for, for health research, for innovation. Yes, I think that's true. Um, patients, families living with severe life-limiting conditions are very, usually very keen to share their data with people who they feel have got a legitimate reason to, to to, to be able to see it, to have access to it. They do this partly because they hope it will inform their own treatment. Um, it'll help with the management of their condition. But also, I think there is uh, quite frequently a strong sense of altruism amongst patients that they don't want to see others uh, unnecessarily having the same experience as, as they have. Uh, of living uh, with a with a chronic with a life limiting condition about which little may be known i think the the recent um uh, experience brought about by the the, the covid-19 the pandemic has potentially raised some questions there because i think the various track and trace schemes uh, that have been put in place with greater or lesser success, success around the world have caused some patients to think, well, who else will see my data? And will it necessarily be used to further my own uh, treatment or to improve my circumstances? Or will it potentially be used to discriminate against me in, in some way and, and make my circumstances more difficult than they need to be? We really need to be very cautious and, and really very structured about how health data is used and the rules of the game, let's say, and the sanctions that are in place if those rules aren't specifically followed. When it comes to, to COVID-19, we can see the whole array of ways in which health data has influenced the COVID-19 discourse. We can see it on the dashboards that we get every day on our websites, on our, on our, um, on our computers. When we're listening to the news, we get a, a daily update on how many cases, where there are spikes, etc. This is all down to health data. Um, in hospital settings, a patient is, is followed really closely as soon as they're admitted particularly in a COVID-19 setting to look at how things are evolving, how triage is managing, etc. The modelling that's needed in terms of looking at maybe another wave of COVID, all of that is based on data. We can also see how data is unfortunately informing us with regard to the impact on patients with chronic diseases like cancer or chronic heart condition they're not actually getting the sort of care that they would ordinarily need during this COVID-19 crisis. And a study, for example, from London, uh, the UCL, points to 20% more deaths in the UK of patients diagnosed with cancer through the COVID-19 period. So this is, is pretty scary stuff. And uh, it, it points to the dramatic impact that COVID-19 has but it also points to the value of health data at the end of the day. So, over to you now. We've covered some really interesting ground on this topic. But what do you think? How can we build confidence and trust, as well as providing quality and reliable information about responsible data sharing? I think there are three dimensions here. I think that there has to be access to really solid, sound, reliable, accessible information that people can really relate to. And the way that people can relate to the information is to make sure that we're using really tangible, tangible examples that speak to them, really excellent case studies that demonstrate very clearly how health data has been used for the benefit of patients and societies. And I think there has to be a, a clear understanding 
a pact, if you like, of the safeguards in place to protect patients and citizens, but also clearly the sanctions that are needed when things go wrong and people have not actually respected the rules of the game. Alistair, would you like to comment on that question as well? In addition, I think it's very important that we build confidence, we build trust uh, in those who are collecting uh, our data when we can see that there is a clear rationale, when we can understand that there is a reason why they are asking, why they are collecting certain aspects of, of uh, information of, about us. Uh, some of it's obvious, some of it might be, you know, they measure the level of an enzyme in our blood because they want to see if the medicine they're giving us is affecting that and so modifying our disease. But other aspects, uh, information perhaps about our families, information about our situation, the reason for connect collecting it may not be quite so obvious. And it's important that um, those who think it's necessary to have this information can explain why they want it, how it will add to the management of our condition, how it will contribute to research or for what other purpose. That way it avoids the kind of suspicion or the opportunity for creating suspicion. It's, it's about maintaining clarity and being open and honest with patients, with parents, with carers uh, about the, the, the reasoning behind the questions you ask. So Nicola, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening on the EU level around digital health and data today? Sure, there's m many things going on on digital health and data at European Union level. In fact, one of the priorities of the relatively new Commission is a Europe fit for the digital age. And clearly, digital health and health data very much part of that. Already back in 2018, the European Commission actually published a communication on digital health. And there is a big focus on not just patients' empowerment, but citizens' empowerment and citizens-focused digital tools, digital solutions to enable us to move forward and really use digital health to actually enhance our overall health and it not be a kind of add-on, if you like. The Commission, the current Commission, has actually highlighted their priority as creating a European health space and better health data governance, which basically means that there'll be much more focus on the collection of health data, big data sets to enhance research and development, but also that we'll try to encourage systems at country level to talk to each other, the so-called interoperability factor. And this is the first time that we've really had that energy and political will at European level. There was recently um, a, a white paper published on artificial intelligence and the European Patients Forum, of course, responded to this positively, but I think really importantly from a patient's perspective, highlighting the human factor, that artificial intelligence is actually a means to an end and not an end in itself. And underpinning all of this movement are major projects like, for example, the Digital Health Europe, project and the European Health Data and Evidence Network, which also involves patient organisations to ensure that on these large scale, quite technical projects, there was always a human factor, there was always a patient's perspective there. Yeah, I think uh, it's encouraging that um, the uh, at a European level, we are seeing the um, approach to data collection on a, a, a continent-wide uh, basis being encouraged. Uh, the recent uh, experience of the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has indicated what happens when nations try and go their own way and, and don't uh, collaborate, where we've seen vastly different approaches to tackling a common problem with uh, very different outcomes. Uh, and some countries obviously doing much better than others. And how much quicker might we have moved our understanding forward had we been more willing to share our data across national boundaries? Yeah, I can and only endorse that. I think um, there have been a lot of lessons learned. There will be many more lessons learned. And I think one big factor is the need for more and better health cooperation at European level. And I think initially the Commission 
had some problems in coordination, etc. And then quickly with other health stakeholders, industry, the researcher, the regulatory community, the patient community came together to look at the best way of figuring out these problems. But in the next round, one of the lessons learned has to be around preparedness. It has to be about investing better, more wisely in, for example, the European Centre for Disease Control. And that also points very clearly to the need for better data analysis, a better approach to actually looking at the data that's needed to anticipate and indeed model in the future when it comes to pandemic man management. Um, and the conversations that we're having now just would not have been possible six, 12 months ago. And I think you also raised a, another very important point there, Nicola, uh, in terms of the, uh, the ability to analyze data. I mean, the, uh, and then share the results. It, it makes absolutely no sense to, to, uh, to patients and families that data which might influence the management of their condition should be seen as somehow proprietary uh, and not available to clinicians because they happen to operate in a different country or in a different healthcare part of the healthcare system. I, I think as well as collecting data, we need to improve our ability to analyse it collectively and to share it collectively so that um, it can produce the advances in knowledge and the greater opportunities to intervene uh, uh, as quickly as possible. And I think there the Commission's desire through the communication through the European Health Data Space to actually standardise European, sorry, electronic health records is really, really important. Um, I mean, in Austria, it's quite a conservative country. It's moving in that direction. But for example, I personally don't have an electronic health record. Everything is still written down and you take your x-rays from one appointment to the next appointment. It's really not as progressive as one would imagine um, in the third decade of the 21st century. So there's a lot more work that's needed in this space as well. Yes, I think we shouldn't underestimate the magnitude of the task that's been set. I mean, uh, harmonising across uh, the whole of the European Union um, is an immense challenge, but just because something is difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt to, to achieve it. Nicola, having heard about these harmonisation efforts on the EU level, can you tell us about Data Saves Lives? and what it is doing to raise patient and public awareness about the importance of health data. Data Saves Lives is quite a new initiative. It's been around for almost two years and it was inspired very much from, by colleagues in the UK, um, an initiative called Understanding Patient Data, supported by the Wellcome Trust. And we realised the impact that that was having on confidence, acceptance of responsible data sharing, health data sharing in the UK, and how big a gap there is in Europe, particularly the further south, the further east you go. So we came together in a multi-stakeholder group to, to look at that and look at how we could tackle it together. And we brought together some of the um, health data, digital health experts, some academics, regulators are also part of our advisory board, industry and of course patient organisations. It was seen very quickly that the patient organisations under EPF should be leading and driving this initiative because it should be based on the needs of patients out there where the information communication gaps really exist. So Data Saves Lives is really about doing two things making sure we have a really, really excellent go-to resource, a web portal, but also a social media strategy that enables patients out there, their organisations and caregivers that want to learn more about responsible data sharing to do that in a really easy, compelling, interesting way, using case studies and examples, but also to build a health data community as a dynamic, trusted, effective platform to be able to have the conversations that are needed in such a fast moving space so that everybody is on board to really look at what is happening from a, a legislative point of view, both hard and soft legislation. How does that impact on health research that matters to patients at the end of the day? I think um, crucial to the, to the success of this has been the, 
uh, the important role that uh, the patients, patient organisations uh, have played in uh, framing uh, and taking leadership uh, for the, uh, uh, the data that is to be collected and stored in, 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 uh, through this portal. I think it's often forgotten that um, as professionals, doctors, scientists, healthcare planners, whoever, have a kind of framework uh, which their training has, has uh, inculcated in them uh, about the sort of questions they think they, they ought to ask. Uh, but very often uh, patients actually have got a wealth of other uh, insights into the impact of their condition which, uh, which are important uh, and which will contribute to uh, a better understanding uh, in the round of the impact of the condition on those who are affected by it and the need to um, reflect the reality of patient and family experiences when planning services and thinking about uh, how to develop research and provide support. Um, uh, it's the development of what was originally known as patient reported outcome measures but has now significantly uh, morphed into patient relevant outcome measures uh, adds quality uh, to the insights that can be generated through the through the collection of traditional clinical data um, it's about making professionals a open to receiving information that patients have about their condition, about their lives, which will create understanding and allow for more effective service planning and service delivery uh, in ways that patients can, and families can feel comfortable with, confident in the, in the knowledge that they're, they are being heard, uh, they are being seen as a partner in this process, and that they are being listened to and their, their views and uh, uh, insights are, are, are valued and, and taken uh, account of. And I think the leadership that patient organisations have shown in this has actually enhanced the ability of, uh, of other professionals to, as it were, step outside their comfort zone, outside their um, traditional ways of thinking, uh, and as a consequence has quite significantly improved the quality of the healthcare that is potentially available. And I think the fact that this is a pan-European initiative will actually help to support patients in countries with a, a less well-developed healthcare system, shall we say, a, a, a more traditional healthcare system, to move forward more rapidly into these uh, more modern ways of thinking in, in ways that might not otherwise have been possible. Sure, and it's all part of this move generally to make sure that patients uh, are involved in health systems design, health systems strengthening. It's one part of a, of a much bigger, very important story. I think with Data Saves Lives, as I say, it's relatively new. We're still at a formative stage of development, but the poten potential is huge. We're focusing on patients and patient organisations at the moment, but clearly we have an issue with confidence and trust among citizens more generally. So we'd like slowly and surely to move towards understanding public opinion more carefully on issues around health data sharing and perhaps widening the scope of Data Saves Lives to see if we can reach citizens and the general public. And I think um, one of the ways in which you will achieve that uh, is, is through the uh, insistence on a very strong ethical governance framework uh, for it, which which will give people who are you know are citizens rather than patients. Although of course all patients are citizens too, but uh, it will give citizens, I think, a greater likelihood of engendering trust in the framework that is created, that it will be used to their, for their benefit and not to their disadvantage. 
Sure, and that's why we've actually put in place right from the beginning a very robust editorial board made up of, of ethicists, made up of authors, etc., with renown in the field, um, just to make sure that we're, we're complying to the highest possible ethical standards with anything we do in the context of data saved lives, because it is sensitive. It's about patients' own data, so we really need to respect that. So, once more, over to you. This is your chance to have your say as you share your thoughts and ideas in your group discussion. What are your local experiences with securing access to and the sharing of data? But what I would say to the audience today is that if you're interested in Data Saves Lives, please do get in touch with us. If you've got experiences you want to share on the Data Saves Lives platform, then we would welcome those fully. If you would like to discuss an initiative that you would like to perhaps expand and, and develop and get some insights from the Data Saves Lives community that have gone through the similar sort of experience, then you would be really, really happy to hear from you. Yes, I, I think the important thing is is to recognize is that um, uh, we all share a common interest a common humanity and uh, a, a desire to uh, help uh, people living with chronic uh, life limiting diseases right around the globe but not everybody lives in a well developed health economy but no matter where you are in uh, in in the world sharing of information building up uh, insights into a disease in its context will help to further understanding uh, and to improve uh, the opportunities to deliver uh, such services and support as can be uh, can be made available. Now I'd like us to focus on the principles of trust and the principles of responsible data sharing. Alistair, over to you. As a patient representative, there are a number of uh, important questions that uh, that need to be asked if we're going to build uh, a framework that uh, we can have confidence in. The sort of questions that that I want to know the answer to when uh, when I'm asked to share my data is well, you know, what what data are we talking about? Um, why do you want it? You know, who, who's going to be able to look at it? What sort of uses are you going to, uh, to, to, to make of it? What sort of questions might you be uh, wanting to investigate? Uh, will I be told what you find? If, if uh, as a result of some research you're doing, you find some insight into, into my condition, will you get back to me? And will it be used to modify my uh, medical care or the support I'm offered? Um, how will you make sure that the people who see my data are qualified to use it appropriately? Um, you know, properly trained, but properly resourced facilities so they can make the best insights from what I have shared with them. Um, so that we know that we are genuinely part of the process, that we are partners, not subjects of research. We're not... Um, as it were, curiosities to be poked at by, uh, by scientists. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's about recognising that we have a joint endeavour, uh, that we all have a shared interest in moving forward to have a better insight into the diseases that, that affect us. But remembering all the time that the patient and the family is the only involuntary partner in this process. You know, as patients, we don't choose to have life-limiting conditions. Uh, it's something that happens to us as a result of our genetics or our circumstances or our environment. Uh, and the way in which we will escape from the impact of these conditions is through partnership, a trusted partnership with all the other stakeholders. And we're keen to play our part in that, but you know, we also need to feel that the other stakeholders are there with us for, for the right reasons and that we can uh, be comfortable working uh, alongside them towards that end goal. I think also coming back to the European context, there are so many principles out there um, and I think we need to sit down together and actually agree a common set of principles that really make sense 
a patience at the end of the day. Um, as I say, a very big patience voice is needed on all of this. So where could we be five years from now, Nicola? I think, again, looking at it from a, a European perspective, we will have a European health data space that really makes sense. We'll have the interoperability that we've been talking about for decades. And I'll be able to go to my my doctor in the UK if I get sick in the UK and they will be able to actually look at the records that have been um, put together in my um, in my local hospital in, in uh, Vienna and understand that data and be able to use that accordingly and that's just a very simple personal experience uh, example uh, but it's far from the case right now and I think that is one of the aspirations of the current commission. I think the idea of, of patient citizens empowerment is, is there, but much more energy, much more political will and indeed practical projects need to move to actually get to that space in five, ten years time. The other piece I would add is that you know, an important backdrop is the sustainable development goal framework and I think anything that we do in the health data space should also be moving towards achieving goal three of the Sustainable Development Goal that is looking essentially at health and looking at universal health coverage. So we need to have those bigger goals in mind as well. Yes, yeah, so I think um, if, if I had the power, what, what, would, what would I wish for in, in five years time? I think um, there are a number of uh, aspirations that we can put forward on an individual level that as a patient, uh, wherever I am in the world, uh, that I and those who are responsible for my delivering my healthcare would be able to tap into high quality information that would inform the plans that I make with my clinicians in support of me, uh, that draws on the latest information that is able to be uh, robustly interpreted uh, in the context in which I live uh, and operate. Uh, I would hope that that information would be available to, uh, to academics, to industry, to scientists who are working to produce health gain by either through the development of, of therapies or through the creation of new ways of um, bringing healthcare to people, whether that's through uh, the digital revolution through artificial intelligence or or by the training of new professionals whose roles we can't even begin to imagine with our present knowledge. And were I to be a, 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 a politician, uh, a government minister, I would hope that I would be able to draw on comprehensive and comprehensible data sources that would enable me uh, to plan rationally for the efficient and effective use of the resources at my disposal to deliver maximum health gain to patients, no matter what the condition was that they uh, were affected by, uh, and uh, to support their families uh, in order to enjoy the fullest possible quality and quantity of life, given our understanding of the condition at that time. On behalf of the Rush Global Patient Partnership Team and the EAPO External Advisory Committee, thank you very much for being with us today. Building trust and confidence in health data is a really important topic. It has been great to hear some best practice examples around the collection, sharing, and use of patient data for better and more sustainable personalized healthcare and research. I'd like to thank Nicola and Alistair for such an interesting discussion. And if this discussion has inspired you and you'd like to learn more, please visit ayepo.com to check out our speakers' bios and download the e-posters for this topic. We're also adding regular updates, so stay tuned and check back regularly for more around this and other topics. Thank you very much.